Hi everyone and welcome back to our next video in this mini lecture series on the Koopman operator. What we have covered until now was mostly theoretical concepts and um, how to compute eigenfunctions and how are they defined and then a lot about the extended dynamic mode decomposition. So how to approximate the function space of the observables by a finite dictionary and then learning a matrix representation of the Koopman operator in this subspace. What we have not talked about so much is the question of computational cost this um, invokes. Okay, and this is the, 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 the idea of this and the next two videos how to avoid explicit calculations of these large dictionary vectors if we choose to select a larger dictionary or if it you know, pops up on its own. I will have exam an example in, in a couple of minutes. So before we start, um, well, this is going to be about the kernel version of EDMD. I would like to highlight the two alternatives, let's say, that we have seen until now and also discuss the situations where these are important. And then I will try to motivate the kernel version of EDMD, which we are going to study in more detail in the next two videos after this, also including code. Okay, so what we always start with in the EDMD setting is a trajectory of M samples can be one time series, can also be different time series, plus for each of these samples, the consecutive time step. So if this were one to M, a time series, one long time series, this would be two to M plus one um, of the same time series. And then we can construct by lifting in this dictionary, um, let's say monomials or radial basis functions, Hermit polynomials, we have seen all these. Um, we lift these individual samples to this large feature matrix. And so I've written here that both of these matrices are of dimension M by N, where lowercase m is the number of samples, so the rows in this matrix, and the capital N is the number of basis functions that we are considering. Okay. And then computing the Koopman operator is this straightforward linear regression problem, the pseudo inverse of the first feature matrix times this feature matrix. And so what you see is that this involves the pseudo inverse of an M by N matrix. And maybe we are in a situation where we have a small system, let's say an ODE with a couple of degrees of freedom, and we lift them to uh, monomials of a certain degree, so maybe, you know, 20, 30 dimensional space, which would be the, 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 the capital N is not very large. But we do have a lot of samples, so M is much, much larger than N. So there was an alternative that is useful if this is the case. So for the case that M is much larger than N, we have simply defined K to be the solution of G pseudo inverse times A where G was Psi X transpose Psi X and A was Psi X transpose Psi Y. Okay, and so if you look at the dimensions, what you will find is that both of these matrices are of dimension N by N. So, if M is much larger than N, then these NR product matrices, um, called, let's say, the, the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix, and when you're talking about final elements um, or, or Galerkin methods, then these are smaller, and the pseudo inverse is cheaper to compute. Also, if you want to do incremental updates, these are cheaper to store. However, this doesn't always have to be the case, right? So the question that we would like to ask now is what if the opposite is the case? So N is much larger than M, right? And an example that one can easily think of is fluid mechanics or all sorts of systems that are governed by partial differential equations where we want to measure the entire state. Right, so we will have an example in one of the following videos. Let's say you have this cylinder 
and you have fluid that enters from the left and has to flow around the cylinder. Okay, and if the velocity or the Reynolds number in dimensionless terms is large enough, what we will get is this sort of vortex shedding behavior, uh, very well known as the von Kármán vortex street. But the details do not matter here. What we are interested in is usually the velocity of all points in space and maybe also the, the pressure. So velocity in two directions, pressure, if we are interested in this, governed by the Navier-Stokes equations. And the example that we will have is in fact that this n, so the number of measurements we have, because what you do is you introduce a fine grid in x1 and x2 directions, or spatial directions 1 and 2, that this n is roughly 90,000. Okay. And so here we have a problem that this lowercase n is already very high dimensional. And now let's assume we simply pick as our dictionary psi all monomials up to a certain degree. Up to, and let's call this d to be 2 or 3. So degree of the monomials is d and we consider quadratic or cubic polynomials and what you get, or monomials, what you get is something like x1, x2, x1 times x2, x1 squared and so on, but this goes on and on because we have 90,000 of the n's, so this x is a 90,000 dimensional vector. And so I can do one straightforward calculation. Um, you can look this up in Wikipedia, for instance, um, or other sources obviously as well. Um, the number that we get for n, if we consider all these monomial com uh, combinations, is given by d plus 1, sorry, d plus n minus 1 factorial divided by d factorial n minus 1 factorial. And this factorial already tells us this is growing, going to grow very, very quickly. So let's have a look at this particular example with 10 to 90,000, where we have 9 times 10 to the 4, if we choose d equal 1. Right, so this is exactly the case that we had, so we only take each individual degree 1. So 90,000, not surprising, but now let's go to d equal 2. And what we will find is that this is approximately 4.05 times 10 to the power of 9. So massive increase, and thus just for completeness, let's consider 3. What you get is 10 to the power of 14. Okay, so you see this grows incredibly quickly. And this is one facet of what's known as the curse of dimensionality, right? So simply setting up such a dictionary would immediately ruin our computational resources. You see this n by n matrix can never be computed, um, cannot even be stored. Inverse computations become infeasible, which means that we are limited to small dictionaries, okay? But this is where kernel EDMD comes to the rescue because let's observe one key thing, and this is what is really the, the most important part of this entire procedure. If you look at the A and G matrices here, this is Psi X transpose Psi X and this is Psi X transpose Psi Y, then what we see is all of these entries of G and A are exclusively built up by inner products. So the entries of A and G are in our product. And this does not seem to be a big deal for now, but what we can now use is what is well known in mathematics or large areas of machine learning also, uh, the kernel trick. And so this sounds like, yeah, a funny thing to do, but in fact it's actually very, very easily uh, done. The idea behind the trick is 
to compute inner products. without the explicit lifting. So this is what we refer to as the kernel trick. And the goal in kernel-based dynamic mode decomposition is simply to use the kernel trick or you know reformulate this regression problem in such a way that we can apply the kernel trick but before we go there let's apply one or compute one very simple example that is very frequently used um, so what we have is a kernel function k that takes in two samples right and then what it spits out is the solution of this inner product so psi of x and psi of y or in other or in the same way psi x times psi of y transposed okay so i'm using the transpose here because we have always defined this as a row vector all right so what you see is if we can evaluate the kernel function the result would be the inner product of these lifted inputs, but we would like to avoid this lifting, okay? And so we are going to use the simplest example where we say that this kernel function, and you can define different kernels, this is the polynomial kernel, equal to one plus x transposed y and then raised to the power of two. And let's take as the example that x and y are two-dimensional numbers, right? Okay, so it's a vector in R2, and we are considering this as our kernel function. So what you see is we are taking the inner product in between the inputs, and we would like to see what this means in terms of this lifted dictionary. So all I need to do is um, to, you know, follow on this calculation and take the rules for, for computing these. So I, first of all, I'm computing the inner product and then I'm computing you know, the square, okay? So what this means would be one plus x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2. This is what an inner product means. Squared. And so now you see we have three terms and we raise it to the power of two, so we get in, term, in total nine times this times this, plus this times that, plus this times that, and so on. And so because, you know, the order doesn't matter, we have several terms appearing twice, so we have six distinct terms in the end. What we will get is one times one gives me one, one times this gives me x1, y1, but later on x1, y1 times one gives me the same. So what we get is two times x1, y1. And in the same fashion, one can easily proceed and see that we have 2 times x2, y2, plus 2 times x1, y1, x2, y2, plus um, x1 squared, y1 squared, plus x2 squared, y2 squared. So you see, one, two, three, four, five, six terms, but these are two, so nine terms in total, as expected. And now you already see what we have done is this one has on the order of n operations, right? If it's a two-dimensional vector, n is two, I have two inner products plus some constant and taking the square root, whereas here I have on the order of n operations. And now what is the n here? Um, let's introduce a dictionary in the following way. If I define a dictionary as square root of 2 x1, square root of 2 x2, square root of 2x1, x2, 
x1 squared, x2 squared. Then you see this is also of the order n because I have now n entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what I've basically done is I've introduced a dictionary, all monomials up to degree 2, but with, let's say, non-standard factors in front of them. But in the end it doesn't matter, right? If I learn a Koopman operator that acts on this dictionary instead of the dictionary without the square roots of 2, this would just give me these uh, entries, well, the square root would factor into the k in the end. All right, and so if I do this, what I've done basically is I've computed psi transpose of x times psi of y. Okay, so now the way I've defined it here, this would be a, a row vector here. Okay, so this is the kernel trick. I have computed an inner product on a feature space, but I have never visited the feature space. I have only evaluated this expression here. Okay, and so this is on the order of small n because I'm just taking the inner product in the original space, but what I get is the same as if I would lift the space to my features and then take the inner product. Right? There may be a problem with these coefficients. Um, you need to have proper scaling factors in front of the here, the, the, the one or one factor in front of the x times y to get better scalings, but in the end it doesn't really matter. This is just a numerical um, peculiarity, let's say, and so you can easily lift this to higher dimensions and you increase the number of terms here, but the order of the, the cost that you have to pay stays constant. And so this is what the kernel trick is about. And so what we are going to do is in kernel EDMD, is just reformulate DMD or EDMD using some kernel function k. Right? So this is the mission and this is what the next two videos are going to be all about and we will see that after a reformulation like this um, everything will scale in terms of the number of samples and no longer in terms of the feature space dimension. So thanks a lot for your attention and stay tuned for the next two videos where we are going to look much more deeply into kernel EDMD. Thanks a lot.